Hi everyone, welcome back. I want to do a short episode which just introduces the discussion I want to have about lies about the Talmud. This will be one of possibly several videos taking one of the lies that are common on the internet that people tell about the Talmud. When I say people, I mean these are from, there are many people that hate Jews and this is wrong, this is entirely wrong. And they will lie about the Jews, they will spread long debunked lies which were written about the Talmud, designed to smear Jews, designed to foment hatred, hatred which has led to violence against Jews. Unfortunately, quote-unquote good Christians have learned these lies, have been deceived by these lies, and are now themselves spreading these lies, telling others about them. If we are dedicated to the truth, if we are looking to be honest, we cannot do this. Wittgenstein said, one thinks that one is tracing the outline of the thing's nature over and over again. Yet, one is merely tracing around the frame through which we look at it. If this is water, then the well has been poisoned. We're drinking poisoned water. We have been given this false impression, this false view. Now, I'm not a Jew. I don't have a dog in this fight. But I do have a problem with lies being told. Now, just as I do not allow Muslims to lie about the Bible, I don't allow them even to lie as they do about their own religion, their own deen. So we cannot lie, and I will not allow you to lie where I know the truth about the Talmud. One of the more recent sources that is very popular is this book here. 1892, a book called The Talmud Unmasked, The Secret Rabbinical Teachings Concerning Christians by I.B. Pranaitis. However, I recommend you read Ibn Qayyim or Ibn Taymiyyah discussing the Islamic Orthodox view of Christians. You'd be shocked. Many of the claims in this book are being used today, and there's a long story there which is very interesting. If you ask the average Jew about Jewish law, they're going to point you, of course, to the Talmud. But the Talmud is not a simple book. Jewish law is not a simple, easily understood matter. The Talmud contains an excess of detail. It has multiple viewpoints. It has stories. It has speculations. It has digressions. It is. It plays devil's advocate. It presents a point, often very bluntly. Right? It's very cold, clinical language. It presents a point very bluntly and says, discuss. It might make a point like, okay, murder is legal, and just leaves it hanging. And then people go, gotcha. See here, there's this line that says this. That line. It's not a ruling, it's an opinion, it's part of a debate. It could be a question, it could be a statement given to students to discuss a point, to arrive at a particular point of law. It's a way to challenge a point of law. The Talmud is written in the form of what we would call responsa. This is Latin and the plural of responsum, or answers. So it's a body of written decisions and rulings given by legal scholars or by jurists in response to questions addressed to them. So in many cases, people say, look at the ruling. No, that's a question. And then it's discussed. It goes on for paragraph after paragraph, after page, after page, after chapter. Some of these are very, very lengthy, 50, 60, 100 paragraphs of discussion. Someone takes four words out of the very first one and goes, gotcha. Look here, look what it says. They don't read right to the whole thing, to the bottom, but they're not interested in doing so. They don't want to present the entire view because they want to lie to you. They are looking to say something bad, and they will look for anything that confirms their bias. Let's have a look here. Many of the questions that were addressed right, within the Talmud that are asked are theoretical. There's a lot of hypotheticals in the Talmud. What if, what if, what if, and then there's a discussion on that. These questions are theoretical, and it is particularly so amongst the earliest responsa. So the responsa will contain rulings on ethics, business ethics, the philosophy of religion, astronomy, mathematics, history, geography, as well as interpretations of passages in the Bible. The Mishnah and the Talmud and the Midrash, right, which is biblical exegesis. And Midrash comes from Darash, which means to resort to, to seek with care. And people do not seek with care to inquire. See, it's an inquiry. They are looking to require. What facts do you require? What knowledge do you require? What information do you require? But it is to seek with care, to inquire. And people are not looking to seek with care. They're looking to smear. They're looking to slander. They're not looking to inquire. They're looking to indict. They're looking to convict with falsehoods. Historians Will and Ariel Durant noted that the Talmud is not the product of deliberation. It is the deliberation itself. Now, when you look at the Sharia, the Sharia is the product of the deliberation. It is the rulings. It is unambiguous. It is black and white, very clear what Islam is when you read the Sharia, when you read the Fiqh. The Talmud is not necessarily rulings. Many of these discussions simply just end. No conclusion, no resolution. They just randomly end. In some cases, there's a ruling. In other cases, they will just stop for no reason, or they will reach no conclusion. 
you'll get to an end and there'll be no conclusion. So there's nothing to be determined from there. It was just an exercise in discussing the law, which is very common practice within the Jewish law. Now, those who attack the Talmud, they signed these ancient rabbinic sources without noting subsequent developments in Jewish thought. Things have changed. This is a long time ago. They don't make a good faith effort to consult with contemporary Jewish authorities, although I've done so. I have spoken to rabbis. I've tried to learn as much as I can. And they do not explain the role of these sources in normative Jewish thought and practice. What is, what is current practice today? What is believed today? Let's take a look at an example of a simple lie, common lie that he's told. If a Jew be called upon to explain any part of the rabbinic books, he ought to give only a false explanation. Whoever will violate this order shall be put to death. Now, this is alleged to be a quote from a book titled The Libre David. I've seen this online. It's crazy. Alternatively, it's called The Livore David. What is fascinating is that no such book exists in the Talmud or elsewhere. It is completely fabricated. If this was Islamic terms, this is not even a Da'if hadith. This is a Maudu hadith. This is fabricated hadith. And it's very popular. It's a very popular fabricated hadith. And unfortunately, you know, the stupid among us, well, don't bother to look. And thus they don't realize this is completely fabricated. And they go, oh, the Jews are evil, which is just wrong. So the title is assumed to be a corruption of Debra David, a work published in 1671. A reference to the quote is found in an early Holocaust denial book, The Six Million Reconsidered by William Grimstad. From another source, we see that it was very common to smear Jews, to lie about Jews, going way back. So this, this history can be traced back to the 13th century, where the associates of the Inquisition attempted to defame Jews and their religion. Here's the source here. You can read through it in this book, Yitzhak Be'er, A History of Jews in Christian Spain. Now, the early material, compiled by hateful preachers like Raymond Martini and Nicholas Donan, remain the basis of subsequent accusations against the Talmud. These accusations are still to be found today, although there's the strong possibility these are misrepresented or out of context, and I'll go through that in the future. Most are false and are based on quotations taken, as I said, out of context, and some are total fabrications, complete, and we'll find those too. It has been proven that Raymond Martini forged quotations. Let's look at an old Roman attempt to slander the Jews, attempt to foment hatred and violence against Jews. We have a second century Roman historian called Dio Cassius. He was talking about Jewish violence against the Europeans of the Roman Empire. The Jews were destroying both Greeks and Romans. They ate the flesh of their victims. They made belts for themselves out of their entrails, and they daubed themselves with their blood. Obviously, cackling away dementedly, I guess. In all, 220,000 men perished in Cyrene and 240,000 in Cyprus, and for this reason, no Jew may set foot in Cyprus today. Bogus, totally bogus, but hey, you know, it was said. Let's just look at modern idiots. From this fool, a Jew should and must make a false oath when the Goyim asks if our books contain anything against them. Shaloth Uchabot, the book of Jordia 17. Pff, sounds impressive, except it doesn't exist. There is no such book. There is no such book in the Talmud. These two words that are leaned upon so heavily here are part of the title of at least 1,500 books. By themselves, these words only mean responses. Here you've got a guy who's going on the internet convincing people with his uh, fantastic scholarship, with his great knowledge, and he's just lying to you. He's lying to himself. Why? Whatever. If he knows, he's being malicious. If he's not, he's just an idiot. Of course, I have been, um, <laughs> been given the treatment for doing shows on this subject in the past. This is me on Jan Urban's channel. I was, videos were made about us, and of course, I'm a Mossad agent, apparently. I've been called a Catholic, atheist, Muslim, Jew. Pick one, guys. Pick one. Anyway, let's have the discussion about, is a Gentile who engages in Torah study liable to receive the death penalty? Are the Jews supposed to kill him? And... Um, well, let's see. Rabbi Yohanan says, A Gentile who engages in Torah study is liable to receive the death penalty, as it is stated. Moses commanded us a law, the Torah, an inheritance of the congregation of Jacob. This is Deuteronomy 33, 4, indicating that it is an inheritance for us and not for them. Okay, off to a bad start. I guess it says so. Those words are there. But let's look at the next paragraph, where the Gemara challenges this statement. Fantastic. Now we see the response in effect. A Gentile who studies Torah robs the Jewish people of it. The punishment of a Gentile who studies Torah is like that of one who engages in intercourse with a betrothed young woman, which is execution by stoning. Man, this just gets worse. Someone's just adding fuel to the fire here. Then the Gemara raises an objection to Rabbi Yohanan's statement. 
Rabbi Meir would say, a Gentile who engages in Torah study is considered like a high priest. It says, where would we derive that rather the Gentile who engages in Torah study is considered like a high priest? It is derived from that which is stated, you shall keep my statutes and my ordinances, which if a man does, he shall live by them. Leviticus 18.5 The phrase which if priests, Levites, and Israelites do, they shall live by them, is not stated, but rather a man, which indicates mankind in general. You have therefore learned that even a Gentile who engages in Torah study is considered like a high priest. That is your ruling. This is the conclusion. Now, for some reason, lazy, stupid, dishonest, ignorant, Christians, Muslims, atheists, all of the above, somehow read up to this point. They read the first sentence up to only the first semicolon and go, gotcha. Like I said, this is what Muslims do. They read three words out of the Bible and go, gotcha. A complete failure to look at context, to read further, to understand what is actually going on in the narrative. They fail to read the actual discussion, the conclusion. You have learned, therefore that a Gentile who engages in Torah study is considered like a high priest. I hope this illustrates the fact that you are being lied to and people are being lied to and they've swallowed those lies hook, line and sinker, done zero investigation. How about you guys who are lying to me, lying to everyone on the internet, admit that you were deceived or admit that you're liars. I think this is obvious. Thanks guys. I will see you on Sunday. I will do a show about the laws of Noah. We'll discuss that because that's something that's lied about. That is really just an attempt to undermine the Bible, an effort to undermine Christianity at the end of the day. All of this is designed to undermine the Christian religion, to undermine God by people who hate God. And the fact that quote unquote Christians are complicit in this is shameful. See you guys on Sunday. Have a wonderful day. Thanks.